Welcome to Meeple Mentor. I'm Jared and we're about to play Nemo's War. Let's take a look. I'll show you how. As I go over everything, feel free to pause the video as needed to follow along with your copy of the game. For your convenience, I've added timestamps in the description to the different sections of the tutorial. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell below the video so you don't miss any of my latest content. Nemo's War is an underwater exploration and combat game set in 1870 in the fictional universe of Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Sail the seas, fight vessels from many different nations, look for treasures, wonders, and adventure as Captain Nemo of the Nautilus. Nemo's War is designed to be a single player game and plays best that way. This is one of the few games I've seen where the rulebook includes two to four players as a game variant. You'll be making decisions on how best to navigate through the game's obstacles through dice rolling and wagering your resources. It's quite difficult to win, but not as difficult to learn. Let's look at setting it up first. The game has three difficulty settings called Sailor, Officer, and Captain. I will cover the rules for the default difficulty known as Officer. The rulebook includes the adjustments to set up and gameplay throughout for each difficulty setting. You may also pick and choose which difficulty setting to apply to each area if you want. Place the board in the center of the table, leaving yourself room below the board for your personal tableau area. You will choose one of four motives for Nemo to play with. There's science, explore, anti-imperialism, and war. This will be your general goal in the game, offering bonuses and multipliers for different things you can do throughout. The rules recommend you try the explore motive for your first game. Put the motive tile here on the board. From the adventure cards, set aside the cards for Act 1, 2, and 3, and the red rising action card. Also, separate all the finale cards into a stack. Shuffle the remaining adventure cards. You'll need to create the draw deck for the game in a specific way. Shuffle the finale cards and pick one randomly without looking at it. The rest can be returned to the box. Add four adventure cards to the finale card and shuffle them together. Place this stack face down on the draw pile space of the board. Depending on your motive you chose, create a stack of adventure cards with the rising action card. Six adventure cards added for the science motive, eight for explorer, eleven for anti-imperialism, and thirteen for war. Shuffle this stack together and place it on top of the draw deck. Now place the Act 3 card face down on the draw deck. Next, create another stack of adventure cards depending on your chosen motive. Ten cards with the science motive, eight for explorer, five for anti-imperialism, and three for war. Shuffle the stack and place the Act 2 card on top. Place this stack on top of the draw deck. Create another stack of six cards. Shuffle them and place the Act 1 card on top. Add this final stack to the draw deck. The remaining adventure cards make up the adventure deck and should be placed in the space for it on the board. Place one treasure gemstone on top of it. Place the notoriety token at the zero space of the notoriety track. Place one black die on space 44 of this track. Put the action points token at one on the action points track. Place the Nemo, crew, and hull ship resource markers on the leftmost space of their tracks. Find the Nautilus upgrade cards and pick out the one matching the motive you're using. Place it face up in one of the four upgrade card spaces on the right of the board. You may also choose to start the game with this upgrade by paying three ship resources. Spend any combination of three resources by moving the marker one full space to the right for each resource spent. Then put the upgrade in front of you. Shuffle the remaining Nautilus upgrade cards and deal one face up for each available upgrade slot. Set aside the remaining upgrade deck nearby. Sort the ship tokens face up into like color piles. The backs of the ships will be either dark gray or purple. Put all the white and light yellow ships into a draw bag or bowl. This will be the ship draw pool at the beginning of the game. The two black ship tokens are placed on the board in these spaces. Put the four dark yellow ships here, four orange ships here, and seven red ship tokens here. The four blue ships and four green ships are added to their designated spaces on the notoriety track. Create a supply pile of the hidden ship tokens. Place one in each starting space on the map as outlined by the dark borders. 
create a supply pile of the treasure gemstones and add one gem to each of the six main oceans. They are shown on the board with a die number at the top of them. Create a supply of the cardboard treasure tokens. It should also be placed in a bowl or a draw bag. These square tokens are for victory point tracking. You can choose to use them during the game or to help you score at the end of the game. Either way, place them to the right of the VP track off the board. Add the 10 uprising cubes to their space on the board. The two silver ones can be set aside. Also keep nearby to the side the sunken treasure fleet token, Arabian tunnel token, torpedo token, cannonball tokens, and extra dice. Put the circular attack token in front of you along with the six character tiles. The characters should all be face up. To start, draw the top card from the draw pile, which is the Act 1 Prologue card. Follow its instructions, including taking two white dice to your tableau area. Roll one die to determine the starting ocean for the Nautilus. Put the miniature on the board to the rolled numbered ocean. Nemo's War takes place turn after turn until either you are defeated or you reach and satisfy the finale card. Your motive chosen at the beginning will determine how many points you can earn from a variety of types of cards, actions, and resources kept at the end of the game. Treasure earned will be kept in this area and has a green diamond symbol. There are many ways you might gain notoriety which will be tracked along the notoriety track. Once the token reaches one of the large spaces with stacks of ships, they are immediately added in to the ship draw pool. If using the war motive, you may reach space 44 and add the black die there to your placement dice pool. When you reach space 36 on the track, all the warships flip over to their purple side. There are six major oceans on the board, indicated by the numbers on them. The other oceans are transitional oceans. The Nautilus can travel on the blue paths between oceans, including between the Indian Ocean and the Western Pacific. The characters in your tableau can be used during the game for their abilities, or will score you points if not used. Sacrificing a character is a free action on your turn, and some let you use them after dice are rolled to affect the results. These are known as using emergency help. Flip the character tile over when they're used, and take any penalties shown on the back. You might have to increase your notoriety or lose one Nemo resource. Some of these character abilities reference DRM, which means the die roll modifier. You'll be rolling dice a lot in the game, which you'll always want to be high numbers. Most actions or tests are all done by rolling two white dice. The game will use the terminology D6 for rolling a six-sided die and taking the value, and sometimes you're instead told to roll a D3. To do that, still roll the D6 die, but take a result of 1 or 2 as a 1, 3 or 4 as 2, and 5 or 6 as a 3. Often you may exert one of your three ship resources as a wager, so you gain a positive DRM. Pick one to exert and move the marker one half space to the right to gain the bonus towards your roll. Exerting a resource must be done before your actual roll. If your roll plus or minus all modifiers is less than the target number for any attempted roll, you lose the exerted resource. Move the marker forward to the right instead of back to the left. If you instead roll snake eyes, you lose two of the resource instead of just one. Modifiers are never applied if you roll snake eyes. It's an auto fail for whatever you attempted. The game ends in defeat if any of your ship resources reaches the final red defeat space at the end of its track. Depending on the motive you selected, gaining notoriety will also end your game in defeat if the token reaches the defeat space named after the motive. So if the notoriety token landed on or passed space 36 and your motive was explorer, you fail the game. Additionally, if trying to place a warship during the placement phase, but there's no empty spaces for it to go, you're defeated by imperialist powers hunting you down. Each turn has you first draw a card off the draw deck and resolve it. Then, placement dice are rolled to add ships on the board and determine how many action points you'll have available to use. Lastly, you'll be able to spend your action points as you wish among several action possibilities. Between turns, you may keep one action point to use in the next turn. If you can survive long enough to get to the finale card and resolve it successfully, you'll get to calculate your score of points and see how you did. The first phase of every turn is the event phase. Begin by drawing the top card of the draw deck and resolving its instructions. It could be an event, test, keep card, or one of the act cards. Read the flavor text on the left and the instructions on the right. The adventure cards may involve a test or a condition for passing or failing. Each test is performed by rolling two white dice. A green letter P on the card means pass, 
and a red letter F means fail. Cards that say keep mean you hold on to it in your tableau until the conditions are met or the conditions let you choose to pass or fail it. Each card also shows a point value attached to a type of symbol that would score at the end of the game. Failed cards are placed in the fail space on the board, while passed cards are placed in the pass space above it. Only the cards in the pass pile will score for you at the end of the game. During a test on a card, you're allowed to exert one resource for each type shown on the card. The resources must be exerted before rolling the dice. N for Nemo, C for Crew, and H for Hull. When passing a test, move any exerted resource back to the left. Failing the test means all exerted resources are lost and move to the right two places, unless a 1 was one of your rolled dice. If your lowest dice rolled was a 1, only lose one of each exerted resource. Upon any fail, the exerted resources are lost, and the fail consequences of the test are applied as written. However, a natural roll of snake eyes is an automatic fail, and any modifiers won't be applied. The card may show the black circle with a skull and crossbones. For each one, you should move the marker on the notoriety track to the right one space. Anytime there's a conflict of rules with a card, the cards and tokens texts will supersede the rulebook. After resolving the card drawn, proceed to the next phase of the turn. During the placement phase, you'll roll the dice stated on the current act card. If you've passed space 44 of the notoriety track, you'll also roll the extra black die from it during this phase. Keep the current act card face up in your tableau so you know how many dice to roll. Firstly, you should determine your action points for the next phase. The white dice rolled will determine your action points available. Subtract the lower from the higher number to get the action points possible. Move the action point tracker token forward to the right on its track. Five points is the limit, even if you saved one from the previous round and rolled a one and six. On later acts, you'll get to roll three white dice and black dice too. You may choose which two white dice to use to calculate your action points for the current turn. If the two white dice rolled are the same result, you perform what's called a lull turn instead. I'll explain that more in a second. Now from every dice rolled, whether white or black, place a ship token in the corresponding oceans from lowest to highest order. Place a hidden ship marker in an empty space in the indicated major oceans. If it's full, follow the placement rules shown on the game board in order. First, place a hidden ship marker in an empty space of an adjacent ocean. The dotted lines connecting certain oceans also allow adjacency for placement purposes. The Nautilus can't move along these dotted lines. If the major ocean and all adjacent oceans are full, then replace one of the hidden ship tokens from either that major ocean or an adjacent one with a drawn ship from the ship draw pool. This is known as revealing a ship. Place the white side face up or the non-purple side face up. Remember to check if your notoriety is at or above the 36 space, meaning the ship comes out showing its purple side. If all the hidden markers have been revealed, then you would instead flip over a non-warship token to its warship side. All the white ships are non-warships, since they don't have a red attack value in the left corner. At this point, your next step would be to draw a ship from the pool and place it in any empty space in any ocean on the map. If you draw a white ship now, it will come in on its gray side. Other ships would be placed non-purple side face up, unless your notoriety is past the 36 space. You can put it anywhere on the map where there's an empty space. If you place it where your Nautilus ship is, you immediately stalk attack it as a free action. I'll cover combat details later. If it's the case you can't place the ship anywhere on the map, you're defeated. This is one of the ways you can lose the game, which it calls an imperialist powers victory. Anytime the ship drop hole is empty, restock it from any ships in the discard pile. If there are no discards available to refill it, then put all the uncommitted green, blue, dark yellow, and orange ships into the draw pool. The rest of the components in the game are limited, so if you're supposed to add something but nothing's available, you simply don't add it. From your placement dice roll, if you roll doubles, you will take a lull turn. The only determination for earning actions or taking a lull turn is between two white dice rolled. You will have a choice if you roll three white dice not to take a lull turn if one of them is different. The board has a spot on it that explains what you can do during a lull turn if you forget. First, Place ships on the map only from the rolled white dice. In a lull turn, ignore the black dice completely. Now take a gemstone from the supply and place it on the ocean that the doubles roll was for. Add another gemstone to the top of the adventure deck. If the ocean already has a gemstone there, then you should add a gemstone instead to an adjacent ocean that doesn't have one. 
you may follow the dotted lines for this placement. If the adjacent oceans also already have a gemstone, do not add it to the map. Next, the imperialist powers take advantage of the lull to crush uprisings. You'll do an uprising check for each ocean that has an uprising cube on attached land spaces. There's a spot on the board that reviews how to do an uprising check if you forget. For each ocean that has at least one uprising cube next to it, follow this procedure. Add the cubes connected to it with any revealed ship tokens. Don't count the hidden ship markers. Roll one die and compare its result. If you rolled equal or greater to the sum, the imperialist powers efforts failed and there's no effect. If you rolled less than the sum, they have succeeded in pushing back against an uprising there. You can choose to either remove an uprising cube from an attached land space or gain notoriety. The notoriety gained is equal to the die result plus any uprising cubes there. After resolving these checks, you may now take any actions possible on your action points track. The doubles roll won't earn you action points, so you would have either had to save one from the previous turn or sacrifice a character that provides action points. When doing actions in a lull turn, all actions only cost one action point. Normally, the repair, refit, rest, and adventure actions cost two action points to do, but you may do these during a lull turn for only one. After the placement phase or the lull turns uprising cube removal, you will proceed to the actions phase of a turn. Your action points are earned from the placement dice rolled and taking the differential of two white dice rolled. You may spend action points on one of eight actions. Four of them cost two action points to do though, unless it's a lull turn. The list of actions and roll results are all detailed in a chart at the bottom left corner of the board. You may spend one action point to move to an adjacent ocean following the large blue lines. This includes traveling between the Western Pacific and Indian Oceans. Simply move your Nautilus miniature to the new ocean. It can sit at the top. The Nautilus upgrade called Hydro Drive lets you move up to two oceans when taking a move action. You may spend two action points to do an adventure. Draw the top card from the adventure deck near the right of the board and collect the gemstones on the deck. After looking at the card, you may choose to decline to resolve it and put it on the bottom of the adventure deck. If you don't perform the card's ability, you must return any collected gemstones to the top of the deck. By doing the card, you may keep the gemstones. Return them to the supply to immediately draw one treasure token from the treasure draw pool per gemstone returned. The treasure tokens you collect will sit in the collected treasure area of the game board. Some treasures say to retain it. You may keep it near you until the end of the game to decide to use it for its ability or for its treasure value. An X means to discard it. Discard treasure off the board above the treasure area. The other actions possible involve rolling two dice. Possibly applying die roll modifiers and checking the table for the success results or fail results. The table shows which resources you may exert to gain a plus modifier. To exert it, you should move the marker of the ship resource to the right and gain the bonus shown. You must exert resources before rolling for the dice result. The table also tells you what negatives apply, such as minus one for each revealed ship or warship present at the ocean location. Some actions let you discard one treasure token to gain a bonus equal to the point value shown on the treasure. There are Nautilus upgrade cards that also give bonuses to certain actions if you have them. I'll review each one of the upgrades later. A modified result of 7 or less is a fail and you must lose any exerted resource. If one of the dice is a 1, lose one of that exerted resource, otherwise lose 2. Also, if your natural dice result is two ones, you fail it automatically. Lose 2 of any exerted resources and resolve the worst fail outcome according to the table. You may spend one action point to search for treasure at the ocean where your nautilus is located. However, you may only search where a gemstone is present at the ocean. Choose whether or not to exert any one ship resource, then roll two dice. Each revealed ship in the ocean gives a minus one to the dice result. The arcane library nautilus upgrade adds plus one to the result. If your modified result is six or below, you fail the search attempt. If a one was rolled, you lose one of the exerted resources. Otherwise, you lose two. If your modified roll is two or less, you also lose one crew and one hull. If the total is three to six, you'll lose one crew or one hull. For a total of seven or eight, you gain one treasure and one notoriety on the track. For a total of nine to 11, you collect one treasure without the gain notoriety. And if rolling 12 or more, you gain two treasures. Remove the gemstone from the ocean and return it to the supply. Draw Draw one treasure token per treasure earned from the results table. Resolve any treasure tokens that say to immediately discard and do something. Other treasures can be kept in the treasure area of the board. You may attempt to do a rest action by spending two action points and rolling two dice. 
Before rolling, you may choose to exert either Nemo or the whole resource. You may also choose to discard one collected treasure token to gain a bonus equal to its point value. After adding the dice, exerted resources, and treasure spent, subtract one for any warships at your location. Don't count the white ships, as they are non-warships. Compare your modified results to the table for the rest action. If two or less, you also lose one crew resource in addition to the exerted resource, if any. With a modified result of three to six, there's no other effect, just losing your exerted resource and spent treasure. For a total of seven or eight, you gain one crew resource and one notoriety on the track. For a total of nine to 11, you gain one crew resource without the gained notoriety. And if rolling 12 or more, you gain two crew. Attempting a repair action is done similarly, but in an effort to gain more hull. Spend two action points and roll two dice. Before rolling, you may choose to exert either Nemo or the crew resource. You may also choose to discard one collected treasure token to gain a bonus equal to its point value. You'll also subtract one per warship at your location. Compare your modified results on the table for the repair action. If two or less, you also lose one hull resource in addition to the exerted resource, if any. With a modified result of three to six, there's no other effect, just losing your exerted resource and spent treasure. For a total of seven or eight, you gain one whole resource and lose one treasure from your collection. This is in addition to any spent treasure. For a total of nine to 11, you gain one whole resource. And if rolling 12 or more, you gain two hull. The incite action lets you try to get uprising cubes out on the board and lower your notoriety. You may only attempt this at an ocean with an empty land space connected to it. To attempt it, spend one action point and roll two dice. Each revealed ship at this location reduces your roll by one. Additionally, each uprising cube already there reduces your total by one. Before rolling, you may choose to exert any one ship resource. You may also discard one treasure token for its point value. If you have the arcane library upgrade, you'll add one to your resolve. And if you've gained the Sunken Treasure Fleet token, add two to your result. Compare your modified results to the table for the Insight action. Anything six or below is a failure and results in you losing your exerted resource. If two or less, you also gain two notoriety. With a modified result of three to six, gain one notoriety. For a total of seven or eight, nothing happens, but you don't lose your exerted resource. With a total of nine to 11, place one uprising cube from the supply on an empty land space connected to the Nautilus's ocean. Then lose one notoriety. If rolling 12 or more, place an uprising cube and lose two notoriety. The refit action lets you try to gain Nautilus upgrades. Before trying this, check the right side of the board for the available upgrade cards. The cost of an upgrade card is the number shown in the corner. You must have the salvage available to discard in order to take an upgrade. You may only have four salvaged ships at a time. To attempt the action, spend two action points and roll two dice. Before rolling, you may choose any one resource to exert for its bonus. You may also choose to discard one collected treasure token to gain a bonus equal to its point value. You will also subtract one per warship at your location. Compare your modified results on the table for the refit action. If two or less, you also lose any one chosen resource in addition to the exerted resource. With a modified result of three to six, you must discard a salvage ship. For seven or eight, you may spend the required salvage ships to gain one available upgrade card. You must also lose one treasure from your collection. This is in addition to any spent treasure. For a total of nine to 11, you gain one upgrade card by discarding its required salvage. And if rolling 12 or more, you gain the upgrade card for one less salvage cost. The final action possible is attacking, but I wanted to leave that to its own section. Attempting a combat costs one action point. The Nautilus may target any one ship in the ocean where it sits. If you target a hidden ship token, remove it and draw a ship from the ship draw pool to replace it. The drawn ship would come white side up or non-purple side up. It only comes in purple side up if you've reached space 36 of the notoriety track. You must decide whether to make a bold attack or a stalk attack. For a bold attack, place the bold attack token on the ship you're targeting. If you succeed in sinking the ship, you may choose to conduct another bold attack to a ship in the same ocean. If you do, gain one notoriety. You don't spend any extra action points to do this. As long as you keep sinking the ship so you can keep attacking at this ocean location, but gaining one notoriety each time. You must stop attacking if you've destroyed all the ships there, or fail to sink a targeted ship, or choose to salvage a ship instead of placing it in tonnage. A stalk attack lets you gain plus one DRM to your 
your attack roll, but you may not continue attacking other ships after successfully sinking it. The other benefit is after revealing a hidden ship, you can choose not to attack it. Some adventure cards or situations force you to attack a ship with a stalk attack. In those situations, you can't avoid the combat. Resolving a combat starts with warships attacking the Nautilus first. If in combat with a non-warship, skip that part. After their attack, then the Nautilus attacks. If the ship is sunk, immediately gain any notoriety shown on the ship, and choose to score it in tonnage or to place it in salvage. First, the warship makes its attack. Simply roll two dice. If you have the reinforced armor upgrade, you may add plus one to the total. Also, subtract one for every other warship in the same ocean. Don't count the one you're in combat with. If your modified total is greater than or equal to the ship's attack strength, as found in the left corner, then it misses the Nautilus. If less than its attack strength, the Nautilus suffers hits equal to the lowest die's result. Of course, should you roll natural snake eyes, you'll be hit even harder. Roll a die and take that many hits. For each hit to apply to the Nautilus, roll a die to determine one of the three ship resources at random to lose. In your random damage roll, lose one Nemo resource if you roll a 1. If you roll a 2 or 3, lose one crew resource. And if you roll a 4, 5, or 6, lose a hull resource. Each hit moves the marker one full position to the right. After determining where the hit lands, you may choose to destroy and discard one of your Nautilus upgrades instead of applying the hit. After resolving the warship's attack, now the Nautilus will attempt to sink the ship. The defense value of the ship is found in the upper right of the ship token. If attacking a non-warship, you would start with your attack. The ship won't get to attack you. You'll roll two dice to try to meet or exceed the ship's defense strength. If doing a stalk attack, add one to your result. If you have the strengthened prow upgrade, add another one to the result. You may also choose to exert any one ship resource to gain its bonus as well. Subtract from the total minus one for each warship in that ocean, besides the one you're targeting. If your modified result is greater than or equal to the defense, you sink the ship successfully. If less than its defense, the ship remains. Gain one notoriety and lose the exerted ship resource. Lose one of the resource if one of your die was a one, otherwise lose two. When sinking the ship, remove it and gain its printed notoriety value on the notoriety track. Some ship tokens may also say to gain something, like a resource. Do that immediately after sinking it. Then you must choose to score it as tonnage or salvage the ship. By salvaging it, you won't score points from it. Instead, it can be spent during a refit action to pay for a Nautilus upgrade card. You can only store four at a time. If you already have four salvaged ships, you must take it as tonnage. The tonnage area of the board has a row for each of the six major oceans. Ships sunk in those oceans may be placed here in the furthest left open space. Ships sunk in transitional oceans may be placed in one of the adjacent major oceans rows. The ship is added with the side you sank facing up. If all six spots are full for the row, just start stacking them in the sixth column. At the end of the game, you'll gain points for the furthest column fully filled in all the major oceans. Additionally, each ship shows victory points on it, which will also score at the end of the game. Warships and non-warships score separately, as shown by a blue or red ship icon. There's another type of attack that only becomes available if you gain the Steam Torpedoes upgrade card. Take the torpedo attack marker in front of you with the upgrade. Place the token on the targeted ship. Once per action phase, you may make one free torpedo attack at a ship in the Nautilus's location. It does not cost any action points. Roll two dice to attempt to sink it. No modifiers are applied. On a roll of five or more, sink the targeted non-warship. On a six or more, you can sink a warship. As soon as you miss, flip over the torpedo attack token. For the rest of the game, you may only use one die to make the attack. You don't gain any notoriety for missing a torpedo attack. I've mentioned a few of the possible upgrades throughout the tutorial, but I wanted to summarize the different ones possible separately. Upgrades are earned primarily through successfully doing a refit action. You may gain one new upgrade per refit action by spending the salvage ships equal to the card's cost in the corner. The available upgrades do not automatically replenish. At the beginning of the game, you also have the option to take the starting upgrade that corresponds to your chosen motive. In that case, you spend any combination of three ship resources to take it from the start. Even if you don't take it, the matching motive upgrade becomes one of the four available you can gain later. With the explore motive, you'll have the option to take the hydro drive. 
it lets you move up to two consecutive oceans when doing a move action. With the science motive, you can take the monstrous design upgrade. By having this, you'll gain one less notoriety when sinking ships with a stalk attack. With the anti-imperialism motive, you can take the double hull. Having this lets you add one DRM when you exert the hull resource. Additionally, when you have to roll random hits, you can ignore all sixes. With the war motive, you may take the periscope device from the beginning of the game. When doing a bold attack, you will no longer have to gain one notoriety for each consecutive attack. Also, you may now consecutively stalk attack, but you do gain notoriety between each. The rest of the upgrades will have to come out randomly. The fog machine gives you another action opportunity. Spend one action point to discard the upgrade so you can attempt to decrease your notoriety. Roll two dice and lose notoriety equal to the roll. I've already discussed the steam torpedoes. It gives you a free attack once per action phase to use the torpedoes. Roll two dice to get a five or six. Fives or higher will sink non-warships. Sixes or higher will sink warships. As soon as you miss, flip over the token to remind you that you may now only roll one die for this attack for the rest of the game. The Strength and Prow gives a constant plus one modifier to all your combat attacks except torpedoes. The Electro-Powered Crew Armor upgrade has two ways it could be used during the bold attacks. After rolling, you may gain plus one or choose to discard it for plus two. The Arcane Library upgrade gives you a plus one modifier for two different actions. Add one when searching or doing the insight action. The last last upgrade is the Reinforced Armor. This upgrade gives a plus one modifier to Warship's attack dice. Remember, always roll high. If their attack roll is greater or equal to the attack's value, it misses the Nautilus. There are a lot of ways the game can end, mostly in defeat. The game ends in defeat immediately if any of your ship resources reaches the final red defeat space at the end of its track. Your notoriety may also cause you to fail if the marker reaches the defeat space named after your chosen motive. The last common way you might immediately lose is during the placement phase. If you must place a warship but there are no empty spaces for it anywhere, you are defeated by imperialist powers hunting you down. Should you be defeated in any of these ways, you won't score victory points. Instead, go to the epilogues book and read the defeat section related to the mode of your playing. If you can get through the draw deck to the finale card, Nemo has used the year to the fullest and will end well or poorly. It may have different conditions or tests to perform. If you can survive to satisfy the card's final conditions, you can proceed to score points and see how well you did. First, place any adventure cards still in your tableau into the pass or fail piles as each says to. Add the equipped Nautilus upgrades to the pass pile. Only the cards in the pass pile will score points for you. Nemo's motive greatly adjusts the values of seven scoring areas. Note that you can never earn negative victory points. You can use the provided scoring tokens to keep track on the board or jot points down as you go on a separate piece of paper. First count up all the warship points earned from sunk ships in the tonnage area while taking into account the modifier from your motive. Jot this number down or use the VP tokens to track it. Next, do the same by counting up the non-warship points earned from the sunk ships in tonnage. Now look through the pass pile for cards showing the adventure icon. Some Nautilus upgrades also have this icon. Add up these points, applying the motives modifier. Next, count up all the victory points shown on treasure tokens in the collected treasure box, plus any in your tableau you may have retained. Apply the motives modifier to these as well. Next, you should count how many uprising cubes you placed on land locations around the map. Multiply that number by the motives multiplier for liberation of oppressed peoples. Now go through the pass cards again, but counting up points shown for the yellow science icon. Check for some sunken ships and tonnage that may also have science points, and the position of your whole resource. All of these will add together and multiply by the mode of science multiplier. Next, you'll look for wonders. Treasure tokens, some sunken ships, some Nautilus upgrades, adventure cards in the pass pile, and Captain Nemo's resource may all be able to earn wonder points. Add these up and multiply it by the mode of wonders scene multiplier. The next batch of scoring is unaffected by Nemo's motive. Look for surviving characters that haven't been sacrificed to earn character bonus points. The crew resource may also give you points depending on its position on the track. Next, you'll determine the Scouring the Seas bonus value found in Tonnage. Find the furthest right full column of ships and gain the points shown at the top. This is in addition, of course, to each individual ship's points there. Lastly, if your Nemo, crew, or hull resources are too far to the right in their track, they may be scoring negative points. 
subtract any point shown from the resource markers above the penalty icons. You should have a total score now added up from everything. Determine your level of victory by comparing your score to the chart in the rulebook. Open the epilogue book to your chosen motive and read the page matching the victory level you achieved. And that's the end. Nemo's War includes some optional rules and variants that make the game easier or harder depending on what you use. Look at pages 28 to 30 for these. I don't recommend using these variants until you've got a few games beneath your belt. Lastly, the game can be played with more people with some changes. There's a fully cooperative mode and a semi-cooperative mode playable with two to four players. Players will be officers on board and take turns being the captain. Included in the game are co-op officer cards and a captain tile. Each role has varying responsibilities, with the captain shifting players when failing a test or reaching the next threshold on the notoriety track. Read through the changes in the rulebook on pages 30 to 31. Once again, playing it cooperatively is not recommended for your first time. Keep the rulebook handy and check BoardGameGeek.com for FAQs and extra content. I'm including a link in the description to a reference document found on the Nemo's War Board Game Geek listing. It summarizes all the changes during setup for each difficulty level. It's worth printing out since it also shows how the draw pile is formed. That way you don't have to find it in the rulebook each time you set up the game. Also in the video description are links to Top Shelf Gamer for token upgrades and sleevekings.com for a 10% off coupon on card sleeves. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe if you found this teaching helpful. Stick around to watch another Learn to Play video. And remember, teach when you can, but always be learning. See you next time.